My name is Michael Lavers, and I teach poetry at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. In recent years, I've noticed myself repeating a few select quotations to myself and to my students more than any others. Quotes that are reminders of what poetry should be, how poetry might get written, and why we shouldn't get discouraged by failure. These are quotes that contain wisdom about not only how to write, but I think how to live. The first that often comes up is by Ralph Waldo Emerson. His essay, Self-Reliance, contains two moments that I see as complementary. The first is this. He writes, God will not have his work made manifest by cowards. This is an exacting judgment. It sounds rather harsh, but I find it inspiring. It reminds me to set my goals high. It convinces me that poetry, even if we are not believers, is necessary and good and vital and powerful. That poetry is nothing less than a celebration of the beauty of the universe and a source of necessary comfort and wonder and awe. I don't think that great poems get written accidentally. I think that all poets who have written lasting poems have had the courage and daring to attempt to write lasting poems, to wrestle with awe, to attempt to write something so beautiful and so memorable that it lasts forever. But of course, if this is our goal, then we're guaranteed to fail, or we're guaranteed to mostly fail. And so we have to grow accustomed to failure. We need courage, and this is where Emerson's second injunction from self-reliance becomes relevant. He is describing a hypothetical young man discouraged by failure, and he reminds us that this man, quote, has not one chance but a hundred chances. And when the rare successes get rejected, as most of mine do, I try to remind myself that I have not one, not a hundred, but thousands and thousands of chances. I just keep writing. I think a large stack of failed poems is the necessary price for the few poems worth preserving. I don't think it's possible to write a great poem if we don't give ourselves permission to write badly. So don't be discouraged when you write badly. Even the greatest writers write badly a lot of the time. I'll sneak in a related quote by the Polish poet and Nobel laureate Wisława Zimborska, who, when she was asked why she had so few published poems, responded, quote, because I have a trash can in my home. The second quote I find myself repeating often to students is by Emily Dickinson, who taught me the importance of getting outside feedback on my writing, whether that feedback is from other people or from a future version of myself. In an 1862 letter to this man named Higginson, Dickinson explains her request for feedback by saying, quote, The mind is so near itself, it cannot see distinctly, and I have none to ask. If one of the greatest poets in English could not tell which of her verses was alive and which needed more work, I think we can forgive ourselves for being similarly uncertain. Our minds are too close to our own work to be its best judge, so I try to get outside help. This is why I'm in a writing group trading poems with people that I trust, people who inevitably point out all the ways in which a draft I think is great could still improve, or the ways in which a draft I think has failed might still have some potential. So find people to ask and be humble enough to let them help you make your work better. If Emily Dickinson felt she needed feedback, then we all do. Another way of doing this could be to put the poem away for a while and wait, and then come back to it yourself with fresh eyes. My future self always makes improvements that my former self wasn't capable of because he can see the draft more objectively. How long should we put the poem away for? How long should we wait? I don't know. I would say wait as long as it takes to forget the poem entirely, maybe a few months, maybe longer. Horace suggested that to gain the necessary distance we should put work away for ten years. This seems like a lot to me, but then again, he wrote some of the best poems we have, so I'm sure he was on to something. Dickinson shows us that mystery and uncertainty are unavoidable. This last quote by Robert Frost builds on that by pointing out that not only are they unavoidable, but necessary and desirable. He writes this. He says, like a piece of ice on a hot stove, the poem must ride its own melting. He goes on to say that a great poem, quote, can never lose its sense of a meaning that once unfolded by surprise as it went, unquote. To me, this means that to write a poem is to never quite know what we're doing. 
it means that we're walking into the darkness, and that if we don't learn to live with this discomfort, we'll be incapable of the kinds of surprise that is necessary for great poetry. What exactly does this look like in practice? Well, I think it could mean a hundred different things. It could mean starting a poem by asking a question we don't know the answer to. It could mean forbidding ourselves to end on an image or idea that feels too easy, or pushing a thought farther and then farther again. For me, it means I strive to write mostly for myself and to give the writing its own value as a means of thinking or discovery. To me, it means embracing what Emerson calls whim, the willingness to follow any idea that I find interesting. Sometimes I know how a poem will start, but not how it will end. Sometimes I know the end, but not the beginning. Sometimes I think I know what the ending should be, but have to let myself be willing to abandon that plan if a new and more surprising direction presents itself. And since I can't know which thread will culminate in a poem worth preserving, I have no choice but to trace down as many threads as I can, and start lots of drafts, abandon some, never quite being sure which experiments will work and which will not. As a poetry teacher, I often wish I could give my students a list of ingredients and procedures, something like a recipe, which, if they follow, will result in a great poem, but I can't. No such recipe exists nor do I really want such a recipe to exist. The lack of any clear procedure is what makes poetry valuable. The awe we feel in the presence of a great work of art is similar to love, which cannot be reduced to a formula. And I think this is one reason why poetry and love both are beautiful and necessary. Emerson, Dickinson, Frost, and many others have shown us the way, and I hope they help you as much as they've helped me.